April 27, 2011, 2 p.m. The atmosphere over Alabama was about to do something meteorologists thought was impossible. In the next three hours, the sky would produce a violence so extreme that radar scientists thought their equipment was broken. This is the story of the fastest, most catastrophic three hours in modern tornado history. By 5 p.m., entire towns would be erased. Hundreds would lose their lives. Thousands would be searching through rubble for loved ones. And meteorologists would be asking, how did this happen so fast? This wasn't just a tornado outbreak. It was a collapse of time itself, where warnings couldn't keep up, where one monster storm spawned before the last one finished its destruction, where people had seconds instead of minutes to save their lives. The day had already been historic. The super outbreak had begun overnight with early morning tornadoes. By sunrise, people across the South were already cleaning up damage, but meteorologists knew the worst was still coming. Afternoon conditions were lining up to be textbook perfect for violent tornadoes. Gulf moisture was flooding northward. Cape values, the storm fuel, were through the roof. Wind shear was extreme. Everything needed for tornadoes was present and intensifying. People were going about their day. Students in Tuscaloosa heading to class. Families in Smithville running errands. Workers in Hackleburg at their jobs. Most new storms were coming. They didn't know they had only hours left. Subscribe to StormForge for more stories about nature's most powerful forces. Hit the bell icon to never miss an upload. We cover the science, the stories, and the human cost of extreme weather. At 2.44 p.m., the clock started ticking in Smithville, Mississippi. An EF-5 tornado touched down, packing peak winds of 205 miles per hour. This wasn't a normal tornado. It was a catastrophic, town-erasing event. 18 homes were completely destroyed. Not damaged, destroyed. Well-built two-story homes bolted to foundations were reduced to bare concrete slabs. A 1965 Chevy pickup truck was never found, simply vanished into the atmosphere. All appliances and plumbing fixtures in the most extreme damage path were shredded or missing. 15 lives were lost in Smithville. The post office and police station were obliterated. The town's water system was destroyed. But amidst the ruin, a piece of the community's heart was ripped away. A five-foot metal sign from Smithville High School's football stadium honoring Lee Frederick, a beloved band member who passed away from cancer in 1998. The tornado tore it from above the bleachers where it had hung for over a decade. It traveled roughly 50 miles through the air. It was found weeks later in Russellville, Alabama by a stranger named Dan Morris. He returned it to Lee's grieving parents through Facebook, a moment of light in the darkness. This wasn't just debris. It was evidence of a force that shocked scientists. Dual polarization radar picked up a massive debris ball, a cloud of wreckage so dense it showed up on radar like rain. This wasn't precipitation. It was homes, cars, trees, and lives being hurled miles into the sky. The debris ball from Smithville was visible on radar screens from neighboring states. Tornadoes with winds over 200 miles per hour can loft objects thousands of feet into the air. Paper debris can reach altitudes of 3 to 6 kilometers, roughly 2 to 4 miles. At these heights, objects enter the jet stream, winds moving 35 meters per second. They can stay airborne for over an hour. While Smithville was reeling, the atmosphere accelerated. By 3 p.m., the outbreak entered a new phase. Multiple violent tornadoes were on the ground simultaneously. Supercells weren't just producing tornadoes, they were cycling, dropping one wedge after another. Emergency management couldn't keep up. By the time one warning was issued, a new tornado had already formed. The Hackleburg and Phil Campbell tornado became the longest killer of the day, an EF-5 that traveled over 120 miles, crossing from Mississippi into Alabama. Peak winds estimated at 210 miles per hour. The town of Phil Campbell disappeared. Entire neighborhoods reduced to foundations. Survivors described it as a war zone. The violence was so complete that families lost everything, homes, possessions, and in many cases, loved ones. After the outbreak, scientists at the University of Georgia launched a massive study using social media data. A Facebook page called Pictures and Documents Found After the April 27, 2011 Tornadoes became a database of 934 objects with reliable start and endpoints. What they found rewrote the record books. A single-family photograph from Phil Campbell, Alabama, was found in Lenore City, Tennessee. Distance traveled. 
219 miles, farther than the distance from Washington, D.C. to New York City. This shattered the previous record of 208 miles set over a 120-year period. The April 27 outbreak alone produced 44 objects that traveled over 135 miles, more record breakers in one day than in over a century of tracking. Imagine a family photo, a memory of a life before disaster, ripped from a home in Phil Campbell, lofted miles into the stratosphere, carried by jet stream winds at 80 miles per hour, falling to earth three states away. The study revealed a fascinating pattern. Most debris fell 10 degrees to the left of the tornado's track, but the debris that traveled the farthest fell five degrees to the right. Why? Because it was lofted higher. At six kilometers altitude, winds veer clockwise. The higher the debris went, the more it turned right. These objects weren't just carried far, they were hurled higher than anything else. They were essentially ejected from Earth and carried by the jet stream. Back on the ground, the warning system was breaking down. Tornado warnings are supposed to give people 13 to 15 minutes of lead time. During these three hours, many towns got seconds. The storms were moving too fast. Radar could barely scan fast enough to keep up. Power grids failed across the region. Cell towers toppled. Sirens were destroyed before they could finish their cycle. Emergency managers were operating blind. Many survivors reported believing they could wait. The sirens go off all the time. This one seemed like the others. By the time people realized this was different, the tornado was on top of them. Time compression became the silent contributor to the tragedy. At 3.30 p.m., the media monster arrived. The Tuscaloosa-Birmingham tornado, an EF4 wedge that struck large population centers and was caught on live television. People watched from their living rooms as a wall of debris moved across the landscape. For the first time, people outside the path could watch mass devastation unfold live. Families saw neighborhoods they knew being obliterated. Meteorologists described the radar signature as looking like a simulation, not real life. One forecaster said, I've never seen radar data like that. I thought the equipment was broken. In Rainsville, Alabama, another EF-5 was on the ground. This one was a multi-vortex nightmare. Imagine a tornado with several mini tornadoes inside it, each spinning 200 miles per hour independently. These sub-vortices can level one house and leave the one next door standing. Survivors describe it as a lottery of destruction. By 4.30 p.m., the scale of the catastrophe was becoming clear. Entire towns were off the grid, no communication in or out. Emergency responders arrived to scenes they couldn't process. One first responder said there was nothing left to search. Hackleburg, Phil Campbell, Smithville, Rainsville, names that would become synonymous with loss. First responders had to make impossible choices. Do you search rubble in Town A while Town B is being destroyed 30 miles away? Many crews were searching in the dark, literally, as power failed, and figuratively, with no way to know how many were missing. By 5 p.m., the three hours were over, but the suffering wasn't. 315 lives were lost on April 27th alone, over 2,400 injuries. It was the most catastrophic single tornado day since 1932. Thousands were missing in the immediate aftermath. The towns that ceased to exist weren't just statistics. Smithville lost 15 people, roughly 1.6% of the entire town. Hackleburg saw entire neighborhoods erased. Phil Campbell was reduced to foundations. Four EF-5 tornadoes in one day, in one region. The 1974 super outbreak had six F-5s, but they were spread from Alabama to Canada. April 27, 2011, concentrated its violence in eastern Mississippi and northern Alabama. The atmospheric violence was compressed in a way scientists had never seen. In the aftermath, Patty Bullion's Facebook page became a national story. Nearly 100,000 people joined the effort to return lost items. Over 1,700 photos, diplomas, and heirlooms were returned to their owners. These weren't just objects, they were proof people existed. For families who lost everything, getting back one photo meant the world. The digital age allowed for a kind of healing previous generations never had. The outbreak changed tornado science. It proved that textbook atmospheric setups can still surprise us. It showed that multiple violent tornadoes can exist simultaneously. 
It revealed the terrifying speed at which supercells can cycle, and it raised the unanswered question, could we stop it today? Warning systems have improved. We have dual polarization radar nationwide. We have wireless emergency alerts on phones, but the fundamental problem remains. If an EF5 forms faster than warnings can be issued, people will still lose their lives. If multiple tornadoes exist simultaneously, emergency management will still be overwhelmed. If debris lofts high enough, it becomes a projectile hazard for hundreds of miles. Those three hours compress so much atmospheric violence into so little time that even today, with all our technology, we couldn't save everyone. What if this happens again? What if the next outbreak hits at night? What if it strikes a major metropolitan area directly? April 27, 2011 showed us the ceiling of tornado violence, and it's higher than we ever imagined. Between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. on April 27, 2011, time didn't just pass, it collapsed. Every minute brought new devastation. Every second mattered. And for hundreds of people, time ran out before they even knew they were in danger. The human cost was staggering. 315 lives lost, billions in damage. But the true cost was the memories, the families, the futures that were ripped away and scattered across three states. Some debris from that day was never found. Pieces of people's lives are still out there lost in forests, buried in fields, a photo in a creek bed, a child's toy in a ravine, reminders that when the atmosphere unleashes its fury, we don't get to choose what survives. Meteorologists still study those three hours. They still fear them because they prove that no matter how much we learn, how much we prepare, how much we warn, sometimes the storm is faster than we are. Sometimes time is the one thing we don't have. And on April 27, 2011, for three hours, time was the deadliest force of all. The three hours that changed tornado history forever ended at 5 p.m. But for the people who lived through it, time never started again. Subscribe to StormForge for more stories of nature's power and the people who face it. Leave a comment with respect for the victims and survivors. These were real people with real families. Remember, this wasn't just history. It was hundreds of families' worst day ever, and the scars remain.